thing. All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no real classrooms right now. Everyone's out of school. And so thank you so much to all our viewers on YouTube of all ages for tuning in to learn a little bit about our really exciting topic today. This is our first session of seven today. So if you're excited with this one and want to keep the learning going, keep tuning into our channel all day long, channel one or channel two. We've got some great programs for you. But today, we are going to learn about one of the most amazing places in the whole world. So people really associate this with Charles Darwin and his understanding of natural selection. But the Galapagos Islands are about a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador in the Pacific Ocean. And today we are going to learn about this evolutionary playground by Colette Moin. And she is a land and sea dive tour operator. She has explored more of the islands than almost anyone. She's shown people all around the world these amazing places. And so without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Colette and take us away with the wonders of the Galapagos. Great, thank you, Jesse. Thank you for having me here. I'm really happy to share uh, with all of you today um, this little special place that I live on. I've uh, lived here for many years and I've been a naturalist on land and also on dive tours, taking people all around the islands. And I'm really excited today to actually share this information with you from obviously inside of our office because we are in the same situation as many of you we are on lockdown so here are some of the pictures of the galapagos but let's get going should i start with the share screen let's yep. do it i'm excited perfect let's see if it works let me know if it's working and then here slideshow okay so everybody so first a little bit of me well I just as i mentioned yes jesse perfect nope we're okay. good fills the whole screen so just uh, as I mentioned, uh, my family is French. I was born in France. My French little accent cannot uh, be lying there, but I moved to Ecuador and I was a baby. And I moved to Galapagos when I was about 15 years old. So I actually never really uh, finished school or have any university degrees. Everything that I've learned is out here on the field by uh, translating for French speaking groups and just uh, had a passion I knew from when I was a baby, from when I first came to the Galapagos, that I wanted to become a Galapagos guide. That was maybe, well, I was 12 or 13, something like that. And then I got there and I did just everything that I needed to so I could do and I realized my dream. Okay. So I moved here, I worked here, I became a dive master when I was 18 years old. I finally was able to join the, the guides course uh, at 21 after uh, getting my English degrees and all the things that are required. And uh, now it's been over 20 years that I am working as a naturalist on the islands uh, part time because now I also have to take care of these two boys that are six and nine, but that are also very much in love with the nature around here. So this is Nicola, that actually would love to do the same, but he wants to do it in Spanish, so he hasn't done his English yet. Anyways, let's get back to Galapagos and let's start here. So, well, I'm sure a lot of you may be wondering, where are the Galapagos? If you look at the map, well, you can see that there is this equator, okay, right in the middle, and you can see the big arrow I, uh, I have placed there to have a closer look. We are located on the west coast of South America, on the equator, right about 600 miles away from Ecuador. Okay, so if you take a look, closer look, then this would be our group of islands. The islands are pretty cool and pretty unique in the way that they are actually oceanic islands. Oceanic islands are really the opposite as continental islands because they'll be all islands that will pop up out of in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So there is only water around it. And so there is basically no forms of life whatsoever on it. It will be just lava. So these are volcanic islands, big volcanoes that emerge like this. Take a look at this. This is a way to get a rough idea. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Hawaii. Well, Galapagos is very similar in that way. We are on what we call a hotspot, meaning that we have a chain of volcanoes that is emerging from below the ocean and that is just slowly drifting eastward, uh, eastwards towards the mainland. 
okay? And so you'll have a series of islands that will form. The island in itself is really the tip of this huge volcano. As you can see, this is a really cool map that I enjoy with a 3D seafloor that is around it. You can see that the deep blue is actually the super deep waters. Uh, this is about 3,000 meters. That would be roughly about 10,000 feet deep. So this is how deep the ocean is around. And then you can see in red all the shallows that made it all the way to the top. So this is just the building up of this massive volcano. And the island would be just the tip of this huge volcano that is coming from at least from about 10,000 feet below. The island that we have with the highest elevation is 5,000 feet. So that means that actually we have a volcano that is 15,000 feet high. It's pretty, okay. And the red also shows you uh, how actually uh, the island is moving in an eastward direction, as you can see there's shallows. If you take a look on the left, you'll see a drop off with the wall of Isabella, the big island, going straight down to 3,000 feet. So because we have this seafloor like this, then we have a unique setting of currents that come around here as well. If we take a closer look at uh, the whole Pacific, then you can take a look at this map. And right on the equator, well, what happens is really the Earth is spinning, and this is making quite a bit of a friction. And these air and uh, like um, wind, wind and will travel together. These are the equatorial currents that are going along with the trade winds. This is bringing waters from different directions in the Galapagos. As you can see down below, we have the cool water, okay, that is coming from the south, going all along the coast of South America and bringing all the cold waters to the Galapagos. Did you know that we have penguins on the equator? It's pretty crazy, and, but that's exactly, this little map here is exactly explaining you how they arrived and how they could actually live here. And then the other main current that we have is coming from the south and it's actually bringing all the, uh, it's coming from the north, sorry. It's the warm currents. So warm currents from the north and cold currents from the south. They all meet at this amazing uh, a group of islands that we have because they suddenly hit those walls that we could see on the 3D map. No? And so these, are kind of the settings that are going to make the islands unique in the way that we have just the very animals that live here, but they are home. We are home to some kind of pretty weird animals. I'm sure not, not many of you are familiar with the blue-footed boobies. Blue-footed boobies are actually not an endemic bird of the Galapagos. We find them in other places, but this is one of the largest gatherings, and obviously the blue feet are striking. If you take a look on the image, you have a beautiful sea lion. That sea lion came from California back in the old days. This is quite a few million years ago. We estimate that the islands would be roughly about 5 million years old. And that's pretty much any form of life that you would have on it today would arrive from somewhere else. So in the case of seabirds like these ones, well, they're flying, they're great flyers, and they find a little rock in the middle of the ocean. So they will just sit there. And because of all these currents that mix, then the marine, la the marine the, the food chain is going to be super rich, lots of nutrients, lots of plankton, which in turn will use a lot of, um, a, there will be a high production for the phytoplankton into the zooplankton that will then feed all the tiny little fish and the tiny little fish will be eaten by these birds or by the sea lions. Now, if you look carefully also, there is a marine iguana there. Marine iguanas are very iconic and very unique of the Galapagos Islands in the way that this is the only seagoing lizard in the world. Let's take a look at that as well. So yes, we have penguins on the equator, okay? How did they come here? Well, they come here with the currents. Penguins don't fly, but they're pretty good swimmers. They usually don't travel such large distances, but what we can guess is that for the few animals that we have in Galapagos, there is very uh, little odds of winning the lottery, stranded really, and getting lost and eventually arriving to these islands. The arrival is not enough because you can 
arrive on your own. If there's only one of you, then there is no point and there is no way of surviving. So at least uh, in the case of animals, you would at least need two animals to arrive to the same place and to find each other, like each other, find a suitable habitat for them to be able to survive, the food, the shelter that they require, and then all the suitable areas for them to reproduce, for it to call it home one day. Okay, so in the case of these penguins, they came from Chile, from the coast, from the south, and then they established on the western coast of the islands because of the cold water currents that we have. Okay, so that's pretty neat. That's one of the few. I have another pretty weird bird. Look at this one. This one is a flightless cormoran. Okay, so where on earth would you have this such a unique bird that is that has lost the capacity of flight. Why is that? Well, basically it's a bird that must have arrived here flying, but it has kind of traded off its flying capacities for better diving skills. They have some, they are some of the largest cormorants that we have in the world with a super wide legs, but they're super good divers. They will dive down to catch octopus and eels. So they're really cool. And why, uh, why would these, Back in time, you know, instead of evolution, we're looking at, a, at a, the process returning, you know, is because probably the lack of predators, the lack of predators in the ways that um, usually the predators on these kind of uh, places would be uh, mammals, mammals, uh, all the carnivores, you know, lion, jaguars, foxes, wolves, all those are usually the ones that are that be eating all other animals. Those animals are mammals and they were not really able to get to the Galapagos Islands because of the isolation. Remember, we are 600 on the mainland. So basically for any currents or any animals to arrive here, they either have to swim or fly. But if you are a land animal, you can't really make it, okay? So in the case of the lake leaves, they could look at these ones. How did we get these giant tortoises to arrive here first? Okay, these are pretty cool. I had to put the picture with me next to them so you can really understand and see how big they've got. Okay, but these are land animals. So it's like, how can they arrive on an island in the middle of the Pacific? Well, these are all against the odds, but you would think that it would be like, for example, any storm that you would have on the, on the mainland on the continent, you would have a storm and then maybe some, uh, some uh, trees will fall off into a river. Any animals that may be also in that storm will try to grab anything they can and to get onto anything they can to survive. But maybe that river is gonna take that log down to the ocean and then we would estimate roughly about two weeks of drifting to get to the Galapagos Islands. And two weeks out, in the tropical sun under the equator that is burning 12 hours a day of burning sun, no fresh water, there is not many chances that many of us would survive. Us humans, pretty much impossible. Uh, pretty much mammals, it would be just impossible. We require fresh water. We cannot tolerate the sun on our skin for much time unless we get completely fried or sunburned. And that's the case of most mammals. But the very few that would be likely to survive would have been reptiles. Why is that? Because reptiles have these harsh skin that are like scales. So the water, salt water, couldn't care less. Sun, no problem. And reptiles also have adapted for really long times, really long periods without eating or drinking anything. So, you know, your family makes going for like three months and plus time without eating anything. And um, so this is the case that applies to most of the reptiles. So if we are looking at our land animals, we're looking mostly at reptiles that are the few odd ones that made it. Now, take a look at these two pictures. These are two tortoises from two different islands. Can you see any of the difference? If you look at the front of the shell, you will see a big difference. The one on the left is what we call a saddleback. And the one that is with me on the right is a dome-shaped tourist. So this is quite amazing because where, uh, there is isolation. 
each island has a different ecosystem, different temperatures, different levels of sun, different levels of vegetation available, different amount of food uh, available on the islands. So then obviously this is why uh, this became such a famous place, uh, thanks to Darwin coming here and uh, coming up with uh, the theory of evolution. And if you get the chance to visit on your own, then you will see these differences by yourself as you go to every single different island and you'll see totally different animals, even though they're just a few miles apart, okay? So for example, the one on the left has adapted with a long neck, longer limbs, and the fact that the shape of the shell is higher allows them to reach for higher vegetation. So for a wider range of food in the smaller, drier islands, where there is not much, not much more than cactus. Cactus that also has grown depending on the prey. So it's a prey and predator evolution, two species evolving together. The one on the right, you can see that is right in the very green and lush environment. These are on the bigger islands. The bigger islands have higher elevation. So there is a little bit of condensation and we have a lot more vegetation growing on it. So then the tortoises find their food available right on the floor and they would have become are grazers, the herbivores. Very few got here, so then there was so much food available that they spread out to such numbers that we estimated the population of tortoises to be well over 200,000 individuals back in the old days, before humans would arrive, okay? Uh, one more, iguanas. Look at these crazy iguanas here. Uh, look at these, these are seagoing lizards, ugly ones. According to Darwin and to everybody, I mean, they were the stinkiest, the most disgusting looking animals. I think they're right, because when I walk around these lava fields that are completely covered with iguanas, it stinks like hell and they really don't look very pretty. But they have adapted to this environment here. And this is the only seagoing lizard in the world. This is a vegetarian iguana that has adapted to this super hot environment. So it's black, and to, not to blend in and not to hide, it's to capture the heat. And then when it's nice and warm, it will go into the water and it will dive down underneath the surface and it will start grazing on algae and seaweed to feed on it and then later on it will come back and just bask in the sun to be able to digest the food. So these are some of the few animals that we have here, Jesse, and uh, it's pretty cool. We have some unique birds, many um, unique uh, seabirds also because we have birds with blue feet, the, that's the blue-footed boobies. We have three species of boobies, blue-footed boobies, red-footed boobies, Nazca boobies. We have frigate birds, we have albatross, we have gulls, and so many of these animals are either endemic or native. Native that it's arrived naturally to the islands, but they have found a way to just stay there. The endemic ones are usually the more the land animals because once they arrive here, they become isolated. They cannot go away or mix with other individuals and then they become quite unique species. Endemic means unique, that you can only find in one specific place of the world, okay? And for all the native ones, well, these would be great places because we have huge populations. Birds are nesting on the ground. There are no predators eating them. This is one of the very few places on earth where you can still enjoy that because of the lack of predators. So that's some of the species. And yes, we don't have to worry so much because that's it. There are no introduced animals. There are no carnivores eating anyone. So why worry? So actually even the sea lions have taken over the human areas. And as you can see, these are just hanging out on the bench and just taking over the whole place. So we have to always keep our distance and limits because it's actually the animals it's their place. And that's the amazingness about Galapagos is that we have been able to protect this place for it's been, this year we celebrated, uh, last year, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the national park. 
Okay, this was one of the very first UNESCO sites. This was also um, um, in 1959. So this was declared the national park. And this uh, 1959 is a hundred years after the publication of Charles Darwin, a very famous book, The Theory, Theory of Evolution, that brought the Galapagos to the world, or maybe the opposite, I don't really know. But anyway, at least uh, thanks to his work, uh, yeah, a lot of people now are interested in visiting this unique place because this is the living laboratory of evolution and it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, just just see anything. <laughs> No, that was amazing. Thank you so, so much for that tour, Colette. Now, I know you did a dive video ahead of time that you were thinking about sharing. If you'd like to share a little bit of that, we've got a little bit more time before we can dive into questions, if that's okay. Perfect. Oh. Let's try. I was struggling with the audio, so I'm hoping that... Just a second. If you have any questions, pop them up in the well, meantime. Actually, so while, while you're getting that ready, I'll just mention to all our people tuning in on YouTube. If you have questions, please type them in the chat bar. Let me know where you're joining from. We've got a few people doing that already. But uh, get those questions ready, and we'll be excited to share them when we're done the video. All right, here we are. Let's... I am having a little bit of trouble getting the volume off. Don't worry about the volume. Then. That... We can play it with volume on and just see a little bit of it for a couple minutes. That works. Yeah, that's perfect for me. If it's okay with you. Perfect. I will turn my volume off otherwise if it's... No, it's all good. This is great. Love to hear it. See what's going on. Oh, no. no it's... Hmm? Un ratito. Uh, I had to turn my volume off and I don't know even if you hear me. Jess. Don't worry, Colette, we hear you perfectly fine. Yes, and this is fantastic. It's neat seeing. Okay, oh, so yeah. this is just a heads up. This is actually a one week of me guiding and taking people around the Galapagos Islands. And uh, this is an exclusive dive tour. Okay, we would go to these two very remote islands. Uh, that are up north that are coral Darwin wolf. You can see that there is coral. We have lots of tropical fishes. So we have lots of colorful fishes because we have this mix of warm waters. In this case, we're in the Northern Islands. So the Northern Islands have all this beautiful coral and all these, this is the uh, butterfly fish and berber fish. We have some uh, snappers, jacks. This is a little, um, <laughs> A guinea fold buffer. These are the two different colors that they will go through. Moorish idols. These are all fish that, if you have been uh, swimming in the Caribbean seas, you would recognize. We have big morays everywhere. <laughs> this is the fine spotted moray. Lobsters are pretty common all over the place. Another kind of buffer fish here. These are garden eels. They're pretty cool to watch. They will be on the bottom. Take a look at these beautiful turtles. Sea turtles are very common around here. This is me diving, okay, and showing and hanging out with the turtles. So I'll let you enjoy beautiful. a little bit of the views. And the sea lions are the most amazing and most playful little buddies that you could ever find when you go snorkeling or scuba diving they'll be playing around being silly with you and just being playful they'll catch up like puffer fish to play with them like a bowl they're pretty amazing and pretty fun to watch look at that he's just teasing us big snapper the marais Uh, which one was this? Okay, and yes, definitely Galapagos is a destination for sharks. Sharks are one of the biggest things that we would come to see. So Galapagos is a destination for divers, especially for the big animals. Big animals, meaning all these beautiful sharks. This is a Galapagos shark, okay, that you find in other places, but uh, that is uh, that is was named first here. This is a spotted eagle ray. 
spotted deep rays also will be quite common around here. So it's all the big wildlife. We're not coming here to dive in the Galapagos for small macro fish or the colorful reefs. It's more all about the big animals and um, especially the sharks. Look at that. There will be so many of them. But this is also meaning that it's a super healthy environment because sharks are the top of the product uh, on the food chain in the marine ecosystem so if you can see so many sharks there that means that our oceans are super healthy around and we need to protect them because there was a lot of challenge a few years ago with illegal shark fishing and uh, lots of uh, uh, sh yeah the shark fishing it was just only for the fins and they would throw the body away Dolphins will come around as uh, will come right in the middle of your diet. Hello, these are the bottlenose dolphins. They're pretty amazing to uh, to watch and share. And I think that's pretty much the end of my very short, short little video to give you an idea of the underwater wildlife. Fantastic. Hello. And this oh, is the Darwin Bridge. Yep. <laughs> Wow. I will stop share, I guess. Turn up my volume. And, and here we are. are. Well, we really appreciate you tuning in. And hello to you too. <laughs> there beside you. Um, so yes, let's dive in with questions, Colette. Um, first, I wanted to just ask a query. So you've been all these places around the Galapagos. Do you have a favorite place to go? Okay. That's the classic question. And I don't have a favorite place to go because they all add up. All the islands have something different. Every single island, like even if you go on two weeks cruise around the islands, every single day you're going to find something totally different. So for me, the Galapagos is my ideal place because it, it's the mixture of all these. I cannot choose one place. If it's for diving, obviously I will choose the place I just showed you because these are the two northernmost islands. They're not even in the map. In most of the maps, I need to go back to maybe screen share to show you the the map of the Galapagos and there are these two little islands that are like way up north so those ones uh, the Darwin and Wolf they're very isolated it takes about uh, 18 hours navigation to get there so they're really remote and that's yeah that's one of my favorite places in the world because I love that one. <laughs> take a look the two little islets up here Darwin and Wolf, very remote and very far away. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Thanks, Colette. Uh, so we got a question from Miss Furnival and her two kids in Guelph, Ontario, and they wanted to know um, why does the blue-footed booby have blue feet? What is that adaptation for? Do you know? So this was a big mystery, and uh, the only answer to this is why not. <laughs> But exactly the reason and the specification for why is it that specific color is back sexual selection. It's probably a random mutation that first happened in one first individual. And maybe the females happened to like that guy a little bit better because he was different from the others. And then he got to mate with other partners. And then this became like a gene that was sent out to the following generations. So that's how it kind of ended up. And the really cool thing is that you definitely know uh, that it's a super important trait in them because when it's time for the courtship, they will do this amazing dance of showing each nice blue feet, lifting their feet up and showing their blue feet. And there has been studies that show proof that the deeper the, uh, the color of the feet are, then the more chances they will have of getting a proper mate. Because it seems now, the latest studies is that it's closely related to the amount of food available, the, how good and how efficient that specific bird is at catching fish. So the, the darker the feet are, he will be a better provider. So then the mates will choose and they will sexually the sexual uh, selection and they will choose that specific mate because they will provide there will be more chances that will provide for the offsprings fantastic i don't think we've ever actually covered that in one of our sessions and so basically if you see a bird with some sort of cool color or feature it's because ladies found him very attractive at some point along the line and then uh fantastic i'm so glad we got that in all right let's take a question from 
um, Teresa, how fast can a sea lion go? You showed this video of them whipping around so quickly. Do you know how fast they can swim? I wouldn't know numbers. I just know that they can uh, go pretty fast. We, lots of times uh, people will confuse them with dolphins purposing because uh, once they go even faster, they like to jump out and reach out to go even faster. Uh, but I don't know the numbers exactly. Like what is the speed rate of a sea lion? I don't know. I know they can go pretty fast and they can cover also long distances because you find them all over the islands. So sometimes they go up to Darwin and Wolf to go on fishing trips and then they will come back to the central islands where they have their colonies and things like that. So they're covering, I mean, they're really adapted to the ocean environment. So yeah, numbers, I don't know. I will try and find that out while we're answering the next question. Yeah. All right, Gail wants to know, do you see tourism being limited in the Galapagos in the future because it's such a fragile and unique ecosystem? So tourism is already very limited. How we do this is that one of the few ways to actually really visit the islands is on a liveaboard boat. These are small boats, so we are uh, restricting already. Only the boats that are registered in the Galapagos are authorized to go around the islands. And this is for a limited number of berth, uh, beds. No? So there is a certain capacity. And we cannot go uh, above that. So it's not like you're going to remove the small boats to put a new bigger one with more beds on it. Tourism has um, increased so much in the last years. Why is that? It's because instead of coming for longer time, people are coming for shorter times. So instead of spending eight days here, they may end up spending like three, four days. So over the same eight days, instead of like most of the boats are for 16 passengers. But if you have these uh, 16 passengers flying out that after three days and then you have 16 more that are coming, it seems like the numbers are increasing. But at least on the islands themselves, they still have the same number of people visiting. OK, so every visiting site has a capacity, a, a load capacity, a workload capacity or like a visiting capacity that is determined by the national park, depending on how much wildlife is there, how fragile the ecosystem is. And there will be only a maximum amount of about 100 person permitted in any visiting site at any specific time. So the national park gives a very specific itinerary to each boat. It's not like, oh. I'm going to grab my boat and I'm going to drive and I'm going to take you all tourists here to this island. No, it's super restricted and super limited. One of the ways that the tourism has increased so much also in these last years is that we have four inhabited islands. Out of the 13 islands, we have about four that are uh, inhabited and with, with people living on it. So we, are, we roughly have a population of about 30,000 people. And everybody has been building hotels or guest rooms or bedrooms, you know, the Airbnb and all these things. So uh, local based tourism has increased so much. And it's also a lot of Ecuadorians that are coming, but the islands themselves are really protected. You have to remember that 97% of the islands are a national park. There's only 3% of the total surface of the islands that is open for humans, for human activity. Wow. Everything else, if you go, you must go in a certain, I mean, uh, authorized company with a qualified guide and within a very specific trail. So it's very limited. I mean, the amount that we see and that we are allowed to visit is not even 0.01% of the total surface of the islands. So we're keeping mm -hmm it's to the minimum, to the minimum impact. Yes. Amazing. So for people watching at home too, uh, Galapagos is, is sort of widely lauded as one of the most uh, unbelievably managed tourism spots in the entire world. Costa Rica is up there too, Rwanda. Uh, so these are places where it's been managed really, really excellently by fantastic uh, groups of people and, and organizations. So great question, guys. All right, a question from Lisa, and she wants to know, what has been your most surprising experience observing the behavior of some of these animals that you showed us today? Okay, surprising experiences after 20 years, it's like I've had quite a few, you know, swimming amongst a wall of uh, hammerheads or not being able to see the water surface because of the such many hammerheads, that's one. 
uh, seeing uh, sea lions give birth to their pups right in front of my eyes, uh, diving with an orca, uh, and the sea lions coming right to your face or nibbling on your toes. There's amazing moments everywhere. It's pretty much amazing because it's like, even though I have been here for 20 years, I still know it and watching all these animals in their natural habitat or sea lions pulling the iguanas by the tail. The tail, the iguanas are coming back and swimming back to shore and the sea lions are so playful that they will pull them back into the water by the tail and just want to try and play with them. So there's just too many funny moments. So sea lion puff, puffing, uh, uh, getting one of these puffer fishes and forcing it to blow up. So it would be his little ball to play with. I mean, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is lots, lots of crazy moments that have been there, yeah. Just two other resources I want to share with people watching at home. Uh, Blue Planet 2, so BBC's amazing series, has an incredible section on sea lions hunting tuna in a little part of the Galapagos, so I urge you to check that out. And a few weeks ago, we did a session with Alex Hearn, who's the head of the Galapagos Whale Shark Project, talking about some of the most amazing creatures in the world right off your coast, so I, I urge you guys to check that out as well. Um, all right. We again, we've had so many great questions. Uh, I want to. No one's asked this yet, Colette, but I, we always get this question: Is how do people get your job? If people are keen to become a tour guide somewhere like that or share their wildlife, what would they go about to do to, to get your gig? Well, in the Galapagos, it's going to be pretty much impossible because Galapagos has gone through very strict restrictions because we are mostly a protected national park area. So there has been a very special law that was created in 1998, that is a Galapagos law, a special law. So even if we are part of Ecuador as a country, we have this special law that applies to the Galapagos. And no, uh, the no residents will not be able. So I moved to Galapagos in 1993. So I, was, I became a permanent resident. So I was able to do that. I guess today the only real way would be to marry a local person here. <laughs> yeah, no, in the Galapagos it's uh, super complicated. And then any other place, I mean, I didn't follow university, I didn't follow anything. So it's just like, yeah, if you have a passion, you just have to make it happen. In my case, I didn't know English. So I went and spent some time in the US to learn English. Then. Uh, I didn't have, uh, I didn't even have a high uh, uh, college uh, degree, like bachelor degree. So I mean, I did a general education diploma in the States while learning English. So there are always ways. What you have to remember is that there is no classic route. Obviously, you can stay in school and uh, go for the university. But if you have a passion, I'm sure that you will find ways. I mean, I was a dive master before I was 18. So I actually had to wait until my birthday to be able to send my papers and to officially get my dive master certification because I was a minor uh, before uh, when I started. So there's always ways, I think. You have to just keep your dreams. Fantastic. Well, one thing I want to stress because you made diving look so incredible is that for anyone tuning in at home, you can get a dive license as young as 10 years old. So if you're 10, you can exactly. get on the path to becoming a diver. Uh, I just got my certification last year. It's one of the coolest things you can ever do. It's like black magic being able to breathe underwater. Um, Colette, this has been amazing. So thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to having you back in the future and, and inspiring some people to check out more on the Galapagos. My pleasure. If you want any day to me to go more onto specifics, like we can do geology, oceanography, evolution, any specific topics, then we can go and do a whole series. And then I will prepare this for you guys with great pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And for now, have a wonderful rest of your day. And we look very forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.